الحمد لله رب العالمين الحمد لله نحمده ونستعينه ونستغفره ونعوذ بالله من شرور انفسنا ومن سيئات اعمالنا من يهده الله فلا مضل له ومن يضلل فلا هادي له ونشهد ان لا اله الا الله وحده لا شريك له ونشهد ان سيدنا حبيبنا محمدا عبده ورسوله ارسله بالحق بشيرا ونذيرا وداعيا الى الله باذنه وسراجا منيرا اما بعد قال الله تبارك وتعالى اعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم قل اللهم مالك الملك تؤتي الملك من تشاء وتنزع الملك ممن تشاء وتعز من تشاء وتذل من تشاء بيدك الخير انك على كل شيء قدير my brothers and sisters have recited from surah al imran verses or well, one verse verse number 26 the meaning of this verse is as follows allah says o prophet say o prophet allah lord of all authorities you give power or authority to whomever you please and remove it from whoever you please you honor Whoever you please and disgrace whoever you please. All good is in your hands. Surely you are alone most com- capable of everything. Allah is saying to the Prophet of Allah to make this declaration. To recognize Allah as the authority of all power. All power belongs to him. First, قُلِ اللَّهُمَّ مَالِكَ الْمُلْكِ Say, O Muhammad, O Allah, you are the authority of all power. You have the absolute authority over everything. Tu'til mulka man tasha. You give power to whom you want, whom you wish, whom you like. وَتَنْزِعُ الْمُلْكَ مِنْ مَنْ تَشَا And take away power from whom you like. وَتُعِزُّ مَنْ تَشَا And you give izza honor to whom you like. وَتُذِلُّ مَنْ تَشَا And you give dishonor to whom you like. بِأَدِكَ الْخَيْرِ In your hand lies all that which is good. إِنَّكَ عَلَى كُلِّ شَيْءٍ قَدِيرٌ Surely you alone are most capable of everything. My brothers and sisters, I say this in the context of the current climate in which we live today. For those of you who are slightly worried about today's khutbah, let me give you a preamble. It is going to be quite worrying. It is going to be very political. So please forgive me if you have come here thinking, oh, we don't want to hear another political khutbah, but it will be. I'll tell you why. I've spent last 48 hours from studios to studios, from television stations to radio stations, responding on your behalf. I know you did not ask me to respond on your behalf. I know you did not elect me to be your spokesperson. But unfortunately, that's who the media often turns to, and that's me. So I have responded on your behalf to the best of my abilities, answering some of those crucial questions that have been thrown in our direction. In fact, I've been doing it for the last 25 years. And I'm very tired of doing it. I'm actually very tired of responding on behalf of the Muslim community to the media on a regular basis. I'm tired for many reasons. I put my head above the parapet. I lose my economic prospects. I lose my political prospects. I lose my social prospects and all I get from the Muslim community often, not all of you, is insults, aggression, and in some cases, physical violence. So what's the point of me doing any of these things? I don't do it for you, for sure. I've never done it for you. I have never done it to please people. When 9-11 happened in the UK, I saw on the television screen the likes of Omar Bakri and Abu Hamza 
saying all sorts of crazy things. I remember Abu Hamza saying, don't worry, we've got more bombs coming. I remember Umar Bakri saying, we'll put the flag of La ilaha illallah on top of Downing Street one day. Live on TV programs. And I'm sitting at home thinking, Wallahi, already a massive trouble has unfolded right in front of us. And we're going to be attacked left, right and center verbally, politically. We need to do something. So I drove from my house all the way to the BBC studios in White City. And I demanded to see the news editor. The news editor wasn't available, but a researcher came down to see me. And I said to the researcher, I'd like to speak to your boss. Why do you have such morons on TV screens? Not representing Islam or the Muslims, representing their ego and misguided self. At a time of great crisis, I expect you, the media organizations, to behave better. So after a long discussion and a debate, I gave him an ultimatum. I'm not leaving this building unless I, I see the editor. Editor comes down and says, what's the problem? I said, this awful tragedy that's inflicted on America, the entire focus is on the Muslim community. And you're promoting the likes of Abu Hamza and Omar Bakri Muhammad, who don't represent anybody except themselves. And even if they do represent some in ideas, misguided, misconstrued, please don't do that because the entire Muslim community will be held hostage for what they say. So the editor said to me, okay, give me some names of Muslims who we can interview. So I gave some names. Ten minutes later, he came back and he said to me, they don't want to do interviews. He said to me, I have been calling all the Muslim leaders in this country for the last three, four hours, but nobody wants to do the interview. I said to myself, subhanAllah, are you sure? Yes, I'm not lying. He goes, what about you? Why don't you do the interview? I said, I've never done an interview before. I've never sat in front of a television screen before. Never in front of a camera. He goes, it's okay, you'll be fine, come. Literally took me, sat me down, and camera on my face. First ever experience of speaking to the world about Islam. But I relied on Allah, and I had full trust in Allah, that I will not speak anything but the truth, and I will not be afraid of telling the truth. And I sat there saying, Ya Allah, that lens is like Fir'aun to me. I don't know what else to do except the dua of Musa. Rabbi shrahli sadri wa yassirli amri wa halu luqdatan min lisani yafqahu qawli. And I started. That was my first ever encounter with the media. That was 9-11, 2001? 2001. Yes. And now, 2024, I'm still doing media. Answering the same question. That's what I'm sick and tired of. <clears throat> Answering the same question. My brothers and sisters, that's what I'm sick and tired of. So the recent discussion is about whether, should, whether Muslims should attend the Eid party called by and called for, organized by the Prime Minister of this country, Rishi Sunak, and his staff. Should the Muslim leaders attend such a party? And I wrote in the morning of that particular day that Muslims should not attend such a party because the people who are calling for celebration of Eid are the same people who are complicit to the genocide of the Palestinians and Muslims should not sit around the same people. Individually, we should advise these people, yes, but collectively as a community, celebrating Eid with people whose hands are soaking with blood, no. I wrote that. So, in the evening, I got a call to answer. My brothers and sisters, we still had some Muslims turning up to that Eid event. Pathetic, narrow-minded, selfish, egotistical Muslims who came to take selfies in front of 10 Downing Street. In fact, Rishi Sunak wasn't there. And David Cameron, who released a video in the morning calling on the Muslims to come. Forget about your differences and come. Celebrate Eid. He wasn't there. None of the, not, not a single Tory MP was there. In fact, no MPs were there. What we had were a few Tory party candidates who came from all over the country to take selfies and photographs, hoping that they can take a photograph with the Prime Minister, which they can publish in their literature when they stand for the election and distribute outside. That's all they came for. Little did they think 
the interest of the Muslim community. Little did they think about the concept of justice and fairness for the global community of Muslims or humanity at large. But they became very selfish, driven by their self-interest. My brothers and sisters, that's the verse I recited. Allah is source of all power. He gives power to whom he wants. And he takes away power from whom he wants. He honors whom he wants. And he dishonors whom he wants. If Muslims think that they can attend such parties and be honored, they are mistaken. Totally mistaken. You don't get honor by standing with Fir'aun and taking a selfie. You don't take, get power by standing with people who aid and abet massacre and genocide of people around the world and take selfies and you think you get honors. You will be disgraced on this earth and you will dis be disgraced in the hereafter. So why do some Muslims think it's okay to go and represent themselves and take pictures with people who supply arms to Israel, who supply political power to Israel, who give political clout to Israel, who use their veto power in United Nations to block any resolutions against Israel, who provide all diplomatic support to Israel, who provide moral support to Israel, who provide media support to Israel. Why do Muslims think sitting with such, such people in power would in some shape or form give them honor? When Allah is the one who has promised honor to only those who deserve honor. Allah is the only one who can give you and I honor. And Allah has promised power to only those who deserve power, not selfie with those who aid and abet massacres, those who perpetrate or become complicit in mass murder of Muslims or anybody else for that matter. Why do Muslims think this way? Because Muslims, some of them are narrow-minded, some of them are selfish, some of them are driven by their egos, some of them are driven by their self-interest, and they don't think about the global interest of the ummah at all. They just think about themselves. It's me, me, and myself. And some of them would be prepared to even sell their own family just to have a couple of seconds of fame for themselves. They have no fear of Allah. They have no regard for the future of this ummah and its stabilities. And such people have existed, my brothers and sisters, throughout history. And they will and continue to exist in the times to come. Now, brothers and sisters, I have a very sad news to give you. The very next day, we had the school that banned prayers um, for a young girl who wanted to pray in a school. The matter went to a court, and in the high court, the judge ruled in favor of the school that the banning was okay, it's allowed to for it to be banned, for, for this girl to be banned, because it's a secular school. The parents who signed up to that school knew that there would be restrictions and sacrifices that they would be asked to make. Parents knew what kind of school they were sending to. I was told when I did a whole round of interviews, whole day, probably 10 different stations, all of them asked me, well, 50% of those population of the school are Muslims. Why are we not seeing a mass exodus from that school, why are parents not leaving the school if prayer was so important? My brothers and sisters, the media was even smart. They said to me, well, somebody said to them, somebody apparently said to them that you can do qada later on, make it up. And they were using the word qada to me. I'm sitting there thinking, what do you know about qada? What do you know about salah? What do you know about the fiqh of Islam? You do nothing. You're just picking up words. I'm sitting there thinking, how far do we have to degenerate as a, as a community to allow and tolerate such nonsense? My brothers and sisters, if the Muslim community was united and they told uh, Mikhaila school, Catherine Birbal Singh, the head teacher, that we want prayers to be allowed in this, otherwise 50% of the population are withdrawing their children. Miss Catherine Birbal Singh would have no choice but to allow prayer room. But because the rest of them are silent, one girl who took the, court, the, the school to court, one girl, she lost. Unfortunately, that has opened up a floodgate. There is a legal stamp for other schools to say, okay, we're going to ban prayers in our school too. I hope, I hope when I pray it doesn't happen. But our disunity, my brothers and sisters, our disunity is the cause and the root of our misery today. 
and has been for the last 500 years and will remain for years to come. Our disunity is our biggest pitfall. Our disunity is our biggest weakness and our disunity will bring us to our knees. Allah Azza wa Jal says, Allah is the source of all power. Allah gives authority and power to whom he wants and takes away power and authority from whom he wants. He gives izzah, honor to whom he wants. And he gives dhilla, the dishonor that we find in the Quran to whom he wants. My brothers and sisters, all good lies in Allah's hand. When you rely on your selfish ego to give you power, when you rely on your own self-interest to give you power and honor, when you rely on your own self-interest to give you power and honor, you will be disgraced on this earth and you will be disgraced in the hereafter. Are you not looking around and seeing the disgrace of this ummah today? Because this ummah is no longer interested in unity. This ummah is interested in its own pocket and its own power and its own ego. There are 50 plus Muslim nations around the world today. 50 plus Muslim nations around the world today. It couldn't protect one baby from being slaughtered by the Israeli army. One baby could not be saved. One mother and her life could not be saved by the 50 plus nations. I don't want to call bad names to these nations. But these nations might as well not exist. My brothers and sisters, disunity is at the core this, of this misery. So I did a whole round of interview, one question after another. Basic misunderstanding on Islam. Prayer, my brothers and sisters, and for the Muslims, for you all, please, mis don't misunderstand me. I'm not criticizing you individually. I'm telling you what your faith says, what Rasulullah said. Prayer is what identifies you as a Muslim. After saying, La ilaha illallah, Muhammadur Rasulullah, the first order, first obligation on this ummah is to pray five times a day. Why do we need to pray five times a day? That's the manifestation of your faith. If you can't pray five times a day, there's something wrong with the faith. Strengthen your faith. Inshallah, you will pray. You will pray, you will sustain your faith. It's a, a, a reciprocal relationship. You believe in Allah, you will pray. If you pray, your belief becomes stronger. If your beliefs become weaker, you stop praying. And this relationship can't be separated. So I said to the world, identity, it's my identity. Prayer is my identity. Denying me the right to pray is denying me my right to, to identity, to be a Muslim. It's a single violation of human right. One single violation, clear. Don't violate my right to be who I want to be. I'm a Muslim and I identify myself as Muslim and I must pray. Some Muslims don't pray. Well, my brothers and sisters, that's your problem. May Allah guide you and bring you to prayers. Wallahi, Rasulullah on his deathbed, on his deathbed, he said to the companions, Prayer, prayer, prayer. I am worried about my ummah, and I am worried about my ummah neglecting their prayer. Allah has talked about prayer more than 70 times in the Quran, not just to pray, but to establish prayer. And yet this very foundation of our faith is being challenged by our country, Britain. It's being challenged by secular fundamentalist group of people who are now running the show. I call them secular extremists. They are running the show. They are challenging our very core of our faith. What's next? Quran can't be recited. What's next? What's next? Fasting can't be done. You can't pay hajj. You can't do zakat and you can't go to hajj. What's next? If you and I are not careful and if you and I don't unite on this principle. If we can't unite on prayer, what can you unite, unite on? Please tell me. If you can't unite on the importance of prayer, what can you unite on? So my brothers and sisters, I bring to your attention, I bring to your attention and I began by saying I'm tired. You know what I'm tired of? Talking about the basics. I'm tired of asking you to unite. Not that long ago, in one of the local mosques, not far away from here, I gave a khutbah about unity. Very soon after I finished my pr uh, the prayers, I had to run, I had to go somewhere. I was on my bike. One brother came and assaulted me because I called for unity. He said to me, are you calling us to unite with the Shias? I said to him, why would you narrow my talk to a narrow question like this? I spoke for 25 minutes. Is that all you can ask me? If somebody says, La ilaha illallah Muhammadur Rasulullah. If somebody says, La ilaha illallah Muhammadur Rasulullah. Rasulullah said, he's your brother. Or your sister. If they're sinning, you advise them privately. If they're making mistakes, you advise them privately. 
But you don't put fire on your hair because you think you've got nits on your hair. This brother physically, physically pushed me outside because I said we should unite. This is how narrow-minded we've become. This is how backward we have become. This is how silly we have become. This is how irrational we have become. My brothers and sisters, I'm not talking about you. One of the reasons why you come to this masjid, and many of you have said this to me, one of the reasons you come to this masjid is because this mosque, this masjid doesn't stand for the sectarian divisions, doesn't call for one madhab over the other, doesn't promote the differences between us. In fact, it celebrates it. Everyone is welcome. Doesn't matter what nationality you come from. Doesn't matter what madhab you follow. Doesn't matter when you say, La ilaha illallah, Muhammadur Rasulullah. And you have entered this masjid to pray. You're welcome. Come and pray anytime. Whenever we are open, you're all welcome to come. That's why you come here. So I'm not talking about you. But I'm talking about many other masajids that we have. I went to one masjid one day. I didn't, don't even call, I don't want to even call it a masjid. Outside the masjid, there was a sign. This is this Sunni, uh, Hanafi, Belvi, uh, Sufi mosque. I said, La ilaha illallah. What kind of moron would put a label like this outside the masjid? What kind of brainless moron would put a label like this outside a masjid? My brothers and sisters, our disunity has rendered us so small and so useless. Look at what's going on around the world. From one country to another country. Name me one country where Muslims are being respected for who they are. They're being kicked around like an unwanted football. Nobody wants you. Just being kicked around, nobody wants you. Referee doesn't want you. The audience doesn't want you. Even the goalkeeper doesn't want you. Nobody wants you. Because we are disunited. And Allah Azza wa says, وَلَا تَهِنُوا وَلَا تَحْزَنُوا وَآتُمُ الْأَعْلَوْنَ إِن كُنْتُمْ مُؤْمِنِينَ Don't give up and don't be sad. You shall prevail. The condition is, you must believe. Condition is, you must believe. If you believe, إِن كُنْتُمْ مُؤْمِنِينَ Condition is, that you should unite to atasimu bihabli lahi jamia wala tafarraku. Unite, Allah says, unity is an obligation. Wala tafarraku. This unity is, is haram, is a prohibition. And yet, you look for differences to disunite. You look for the smallest difference you have with your brother to cause trouble and fitna. My brothers and sisters, Allah Azza wa Jal says, Qulillahumma malik al mulki tu'til mulka man tasha. Wa tanzi'u al mulka min man tasha. وَتُعِزُّ مَنْ تَشَى وَتُذِلُّ مَنْ تَشَى بِأَذِكَ الْخَيْرِ إِنَّكَ عَلَى كُلِّ شَيْءٍ قَدِيرٍ Say, O Muhammad, Allah is power and all authority of power belongs to Allah. He gives power to whom He wants and He takes away power from whom He wants. He gives izzah to whom He wants and He takes away izzah from whom He wants. He gives honor to whom He wants and takes away honor from whom He wants. And in his hand, Ya Rabbi, in your hand, lies all that which is good. And you are the most capable of everything. You have all power over everything. If Muslims had that faith and belief, we won't be where we are today, my brothers and sisters. I won't be running around like a headless chicken answering those questions so basic. Nobody would dare question our sanctity. Nobody would dare violate our rights. If we were united, we're so disunited, we don't even have a single MP in the parliament who can speak on your behalf. We don't even have one single MP in the parliament who could represent your interest in the parliament and speak on your behalf. We have some Muslim MPs, yes. So, do they represent your interest? No. And yet you vote for them blindly every election. You have a council locally. You don't have many, you don't have many councillors who represent your interest. And you vote for those who don't represent you blindly every time they come around voting for you. Vote for me and you vote for them. Why? Why do you vote for them? What do you gain? We don't learn from the same mistakes, my brothers and sisters. And we see the despotic regime around the world. The Middle East, the Asian countries, the African countries, North African countries. Year after year, the same despotic regime keep on ruling you and I, keep on attacking you and I, keep on destroying you and I, keep on humiliating you and I, and give, don't give a monkeys about what's going on to this ummah, and they still remain rulers. The ummah, two billion of us, can't do anything. Do you know why? Because you're disunited. 
because we don't believe in Allah properly. If we believed in Allah properly and we were united, Allah would have given us the power and the honor that belongs to you and me. Only when we deserve it, we'll get it. At the moment, there is a lot of work to do, my brothers and sisters. I don't want to leave you with doom and gloom. We still have to work. We have a lot of work to do. Carry on. Even if I get insulted, I'll still go on speak. Even if I get pushed outside or hit outside, I'll keep on talking about, talking about unity. You're not going to silence me. We need all of you to do the same. Change must begin. And change must begin now. The 40,000 Palestinians who have been blown to bits, massacred, genocide perpetrated against them. Their lives is worth something in your eyes. They may be shuhada in the eyes of Allah, but the lives that they've given up, if the world changes because they have been killed, they've been mercilessly murdered, and if our fate changes, then that's the, the success of the shuhada. They've left a legacy of change on this earth. And from the ashes of the shuhada, they will spring on this earth, great leaders, emerge on this earth, people who call for peace and justice for all people of this world. Then that's a success. But if we don't change, another 40,000 killed. A million killed in Syria, we did very little. Thousands are killed in Kashmir, we've done very little. In Afghanistan, bombed for 20 years, we did very little. Iraq, decimated, we did very little. When will we do something? I say now. My brothers and sisters, it's time to change now. We have a very clear message. Our message is message of justice and fairness for all people in all parts of the world. We are a nation balanced in the middle. We are in the middle. We're not extreme. We call for justice and fairness for all people of this earth. And our identity is we're Muslims. We pray. We don't compromise. Very simple message. And we unite. More powerful message than you can ever imagine. May Allah unite our hearts. May Allah keep us on the right path. And may Allah change this ummah to become a powerful ummah. An ummah with honor and dignity. Wa akhir da'wana. And alhamdulillahi rabbil alameen. Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim. Alhamdulillahi rabbil alameen. Wa salatu wa salamu ala Muhammadin. Wa ala alihi wa sahbihi wa sallam. My brothers and sisters, to finish off. Look, <clears throat> you may think this brother is talking about doom and gloom and surely we should leave the masjid not feeling so doomy and gloomy. No, look, I don't talk about doom and gloom without doing work. I don't think I need to tell you the work that I do. Not a single day passes by without me doing something so that I can see, inshallah, inshallah within my capacity that I'm making one contribution to the future of this ummah. Surely you can find something that you can do. Surely... You can find something that you can do. Ask yourself, what am I doing for this ummah? What am I doing for this ummah? Ask yourself this question. What am I doing? Am I waking up every morning just going to work, earning a lot of money, having hundreds of properties under my name, lots of businesses, I'm making lots of money, mashallah. None of this will go to your grave. None of them will be beneficial unless you can use this for the betterment of this ummah. Unless you can use this to change this ummah. On the 27th night of Ramadan, when we asked, is there anybody here who could donate a million for our school building's renovation. One brother sitting over there, he sent me a WhatsApp message, yes, me and my wife will give you a million. Subhanallah. This is what you call using the money that Allah has given him. You've got money, use it for the right reason. We don't have to, we shouldn't come around begging you to do something for the masjid. It's your masjid, do something about it. You've got money, Spend it so that you can build more media organizations that can represent Islam and the Muslims in the wider world. You've got money. Do things productively supporting campaigns and projects and programs. You've got skills. Utilize them for the betterment of this ummah. Get away from your selfish and your egotistical journey that you've gone on for too long. It's about time you parked all of that. Collective interest of this ummah. Use your skills for the collective interest of this ummah. One brother said to me a few days ago at Fajr, brother... The only skill I have is I'm an electrician. Can I give my electrician skills for the service of this ummah in renovating this building? And I will not charge you a single penny. That's called giving his skills. On Eid day, another brother said to me, my brother, I'm a carpenter. The only skill I have is a carpentry skill. 
Can I restore all the windows of that building? And at my expense, I will sponsor all the windows and I'll do them myself. My brothers and sisters, there are people who come to me and say, I only know how to teach Quran. Can I teach Quran? There are people who come and say, I, can, I know how to sweep the floor. Can I sweep the floor? I know people who come and say, I know how to talk. Let me talk. Wallahi, my brothers and sisters, the le- uh, list of things you can do are endless. Don't wait for me to give you a list. Make your own. Look at the ummah's situation right now. Unite together. Put your efforts, put your money where your mouth is. The world will change. I'll finish here. My brothers and sisters, I plead to you. I beg you. And I request you to get involved in bringing about a change. Being passive, not acceptable. Tolerating the intolerable is not acceptable. Turning a blind eye to the troubles of the world is not acceptable. It's not acceptable. It's not acceptable. And it is not befitting a true Muslim. Ya Arhamur Rahimin, Ya Akramul Akramin, forgive us, Ya Allah. Forgive us, Ya Allah. Ya Arhamur Rahimin, bestow your mercy upon us, Ya Allah. Strengthen us in our Iman, Ya Allah. In our Taqwa, Ya Allah. Ya Arhamur Rahimin, relieve this Ummah from the troubles and calamities, Ya Allah. Free Al Aqsa, Ya Allah. Free Gaza, Ya Allah. Free Palestine from occupation, Ya Allah. Ya Arhamur Rahimin, free Yemen from the wars, Ya Allah. Free Afghanistan from the troubles and the fitna, Ya Allah. Free Pakistan, from Bangladesh from all troubles and fitna, Ya Allah. Free Syria from the tyrants, Ya Allah. Free Iraq from fitna, Ya Allah. Free the whole world from fitna and troubles, Ya Allah. Restore peace and stability on this earth, Ya Allah. Restore peace and stability on this earth, Ya Allah. Protect our Ummah, Ya Allah. Make us your ambassadors, Ya Allah. Unite our hearts, Ya Allah. Unite our hearts, Ya Allah. Unite our hearts, Ya Allah. ربنا تقبل منا انك انت السميع العليم وتب علينا يا مولانا انك انت التواب الرحيم ان الله يامر بالعدل والاحسان وايتاء ذي القربى وينهى عن الفحشاء والمنكر والبغي يعظكم لعلكم تذكرون فاذكروني اذكركم واشكروا لي ولا تكفرون والله يعلم ما تصنعون قبل الصلاه please stand up and make the line straight leave no gaps and uh, switch off your mobile phone